SoFi reports earnings this Monday, May 1st, before the bell. And I think that this quarter, they're going to crush all analyst expectations in terms of what we can expect. I think they're beating on revenue, EPS, and I think they're also going to be remaining very aggressive towards their guidance, their full year outlook of profitability by the end of the year. And in this video, I'm going to break down all of their business segments and share my thoughts segment by segment as to what we can expect for SoFi's earnings this upcoming Monday. So unlike previous earnings where we focused exclusively on members and total products, this time around, I want to focus exclusively on their business segments, starting off with financial services. This is the first quarter that SoFi's had options trading fully, and the margins rates have been increasing, which I think definitely bodes well for SoFi's financial services growth. Remember, this is the only portion of their business that is still unprofitable, and it's a portion of their business which they believe they can turn into profitability by the end of the year. Not to mention that I think overall, from a revenue perspective, SoFi has had historically very strong Q1s. Here's a chart on the screen by Chris Hager on his new Substack article, which is linked in the description below, which is measuring SoFi's quarter over quarter revenue growth over the past two years. And we can see that almost every quarter, the company has been increasing overall revenue by double digits. Obviously, this is very bullish. And I think that financial services is really the last segment to reach that profitability and join the loan segment and technology platform to get SoFi to profitability by the end of the year. So I'm definitely expecting some positive results here, although there are some headwinds in terms of some of the expenses that are associated with financial services that could bog this down. Now, I'm gonna come back to some of these negative expenses that are affecting financial services later on in the video, but first let's talk at a high level about the tech platform. If you'll remember on the last earnings call, the margins for the tech platform came in weaker than expected. Management, of course, attributed these expenses to that migration to the cloud from on-prem services, and they highlighted that by the end of the year, 2023, the margins would come back for the tech platform. So obviously, that's one of the main things that we're looking at for the tech segment specifically. Now, if you remember, this quarter was also one where the tech platform had some minor layoffs. Both the Galileo and Technicis team had a very small percentage of their staff uh, laid off which we later found out from a leaked email from Derek White, which I made a full video about, and I don't think anybody else was covering it at the time, that management was saying that these layoffs were in an effort to realign both companies post-merger and cut a lot of the redundancies in roles that they had both on Technicist and Galileo's side. Now, later on down the line, about a month ago, Galileo and Technicist fully merged under that Galileo umbrella. I talked about this in a recent video as well, where a lot of the Technicist leadership, including Miguel Santos, their founder, moved into strategic leadership roles for Galileo. And so now for the technology platform, that's all gonna be encompassed in the Galileo umbrella, which would obviously lead to more efficient services. And it makes sense from that redundancy perspective why they would do those layoffs preempting this move. In terms of a personal loan perspective, I still expect personal loans to be carrying the majority of the weight in terms of the loan segment growth for SoFi and obviously the majority of the revenue that contributes to that segment. Obviously, we're still in a high rate environment from a macro perspective. Other loan segments such as home loans and student loans are down. But as a result of this macro environment, the high rate environment, personal loans are going to benefit since SoFi makes more money in that type of environment. Student loans, not much to say here. It's still affected by that Supreme Court decision. I personally don't think that there's going to be any meaningful updates. This is probably going to be down year over year, in my opinion, and it's definitely going to be in the back burner until we have a final decision on what that moratorium situation looks like. In terms of the home loans, I think this is more interesting on the lending segment because we're probably going to get some more details around the acquisition of Wyndham Capital that was completed a couple of weeks ago and how that is going to integrate into the wider ecosystem under that SoFi's uh, core technology umbrella. And what investors are looking for here is exactly what this acquisition costs SoFi. There is a chance that this number is not disclosed. There's also a chance that you know SoFi discloses it and investors think that they pay too much and the stock goes down. But the flip side of that is you know, if SoFi paid a reasonable amount for that, if they got a deal, the stock will conversely go up, right? The stock was up when SoFi announced that it was an all cash deal. So it stands to reason that if they paid a reasonable amount for this purchase, the stock would respond positively. Now, the acquisition was an all cash deal. So the new cash position will tell that story if this is not fully disclosed. But I do think that management is going to be asked 
and we'll talk about it on the call. And if they don't talk about it from a pure dollars and cents perspective, I do believe that they are going to talk about it from an integration perspective, how they're going to fold Wyndham Capital into their core technologies. Moving on to their banking side. I think this was a huge quarter on the macro perspective with the SVB collapse with Signature Bank and FRC, which just went into receivership this week. In response to this, so if I raise their FDIC insurance limit from 250,000 to 2 million FDIC insurance, and in essence, what this means, considering SoFi's core demographic, it means that something like 95% plus of all of SoFi's users are FDIC insured. Obviously, this is a reassurance to these customers after what just happened with Silicon Valley Bank. In addition, SoFi raised their savings APY to 4.2%, even higher than Apple's, which came out a couple of weeks ago with 4.15% APY. SoFi had a 4% APY on their savings account, and they quickly responded to the Apple news by raising to just be the highest APY out there. This is obviously a position of strength that SoFi is coming at and trying to maximize those deposits that they're getting from customers. So the main question for me on the banking side is really how does this macro environment affect SoFi's business this quarter because that's when it's going to be reflected in the numbers and what story will those numbers tell in general? One of the main factors to answer that question is really deposit growth. Now, someone on our Discord shared this and I found that it was interesting so I wanted to share it in this video. The FFIEC report for SoFi was released recently. This is a long report that highlights you know, all banks. You can search for it. I'm going to put the link in the description. And when you search SoFi, you can scroll down to their balance sheet and the balance sheet shows about $10.3 billion in deposits. Keep in mind that this was just updated yesterday on Friday, April 28th. And it shows 10.3 billion roughly in deposits. And we know that deposits last quarter was around 7.6 or 7.3 billion, something to that effect. So it suggests that the inflows for this quarter is close to 3 billion in terms of net new deposits. Now, I'm not sure how accurate this is. Uh, but it makes sense for it to be in that range because Anthony Noto in a recent investor conference said that the company expects an increase in deposits for this quarter to be equal or greater than the last few quarters. And the last few quarters, basically the floor is 2.3 billion. So we can expect a minimum 2.3 billion added in terms of net new deposits. And if this report is saying that we're closer to 3 billion in deposits, obviously that's very bullish for SoFi. So I'm not sure how accurate this FFIEC report is going to be, but it was definitely an interesting finding that was brought up in our Discord. And of course, you can join that Discord free. Link is in the description below. So that was a really interesting indicator that suggests that SoFi is going to beat their deposit growth and obviously is more bullish for SoFi investors. Okay, moving down to expenses. I think the main thing to consider on expenses here is stock-based compensation. We've talked about this quite a bunch, and this was one of the biggest objections that SoFi had in 2021, as stock-based compensation as a percentage of revenue peaked at around 25%. Now, this is very high, and this has been on a downtrend. And it's been on a downtrend really for two reasons. Number one, revenue has been going up. Number two, the stock-based compensation expense in itself has been going down since the second quarter of 2022. So when you put both of these factors together, stock-based compensation as a percentage of revenue has fallen quite drastically from, you know, 27%-ish to about 15% now. Now, this is a huge positive, right? Because what this means is, you know, obviously stock-based compensation is a non-cash expense, but it does affect the bottom line. And it is a positive trend as SBC will continue to fall as revenue continues to go up. The other expenses that I really want to see in addition to stock-based compensation is around financial services and marketing. Now, if the forecast on the macro perspective is weak, in other words, if demand is weak just from a macro perspective, then it makes sense just logically thinking that the business is going to lower their marketing spend because they're going to be less effective on that marketing spend. However, on this point, uh, I hopped on a live stream with Tanner on Wednesday or Thursday listening to Lending Club earnings calls, and they mentioned that borrower demand remains strong especially on the credit card side, right? Demand is sky high for credit cards. We see that on the news all the time. And so from an expense perspective, this is gonna be reflected in SoFi's numbers to see if they're pumping more money in terms of marketing spend or if they're reeling back because they think that demand is low in the macro. So that's one of the things that I'll be looking for in their expense category to see what they're doing with their marketing expense 
for financial services because just going back to financial services, remember that they expect us to be profitable by the end of the year. So how they address their expenses for this segment is gonna be very important towards that profitability by the end of the year. Finally, from an outlook perspective, I think Lending Club, since we're on the topic, flashed many warning signs over the economy just from a lending perspective, from a loans perspective in general. Outlook is my main worry here for SoFi. Since the company can't control the macro environment, what happens? Lending Club in their earnings said that they were being overly cautious to position themselves more conservatively in case that there's more turmoil ahead. Another Silicon Valley bank or another bank starts to collapse. It might be more prudent for SoFi to also do the same. In other words, to invest less in pure growth and to have more reserves and be more conservative depending on what happens in the macro environment. Although SoFi has been in the past more aggressive, whereas Lending Club has been more conservative, and we've talked at length about a deep peg between SoFi and Lending Club, where SoFi continues to go up in terms of deposit growth, and Lending Club is actually going down in terms of that same metric. Now, don't forget, I've said this many times in the past, that the elephant in the room for SoFi is really their habit of under-promising and over-delivering. And in the eyes of many investors, what they're gonna be looking at right now is that profitability towards the end of the year? Is SoFi still tracking to be profitable by the end of the year? Or are they going to adjust that to the downside? Obviously, we're going to be getting more details on Monday, but I personally still think that they're in track as I've gone on record many times to say that profitability, in my opinion, is going to come in Q3, not Q4. In terms of EPS, their bottom line, I think that negative two cents is my estimate. This is in line with the trend that we've been seeing towards break even for Q3, that forecast. It's also in line with the growth rate that SoFi has been having from a bottom line perspective. They were, you know, negative 14, negative 12, negative 9, negative 5. I think negative 2 is uh, something to be expecting for SoFi's EPS. Now, SoFi stock has been on an uptrend this week. Last earnings, the stock shot up over $8 a share. And I expect on a good earnings, we could see a similar result on Monday. But remember that SoFi stock has this bad habit of shooting up on the day of earnings and then gradually giving up all of those gains over the subsequent months. Personally, I've been buying more SoFi stock in this quarter alone. I've added about 1,500 shares to my position. My cost basis on SoFi is about $8 per share. Uh, I'll likely be talking about SoFi earnings on the SoFi Weekly Podcast later tonight. And in addition to this, I'll also be covering the live stream uh, live on Monday morning. So stay tuned for that. For right now, this is the Fundamentals Investing Podcast. I hope this video was helpful for you. Thank you so much for watching.